Welcome to Dementia Friendly, Prince George's County, Maryland, Northern Sector Webinar Series for Caregivers. Today's topic is Spiritual Care for People with Dementia by Patty Mouton, sponsored by Prince George's County Government and the Department of Family Services. Welcome, and um, it's really going to be my pleasure to talk about the issue of spiritual care and connection for people with dementia. Um, I am not an ordained clergy, but I do have a graduate certificate in palliative care chaplaincy from the Palliative Care Institute at Cal State San Marcos out here on the West Coast. And um, I'm involved in a very, very comprehensive program called Caring for the Whole Person through the Catholic Diocese of um, California, the Conference of Catholic Bishops in California. So this is a, a, a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. I've spent about 25 years in dementia care, and I really believe that spirituality and attending to people's spiritual needs makes a huge difference in the quality of life and their quality of care. So let's talk a little bit about all of this. In our society today, we value hypercognition. The smarter you are, the better the person you are. Dementia is actually more feared than death by most Americans. And it's because dementia attacks all of these values uh, with a focus on education and individuality and autonomy. We are all about what can we do? What can we want? How do we get what we want? Um, it's, it's really tough on people with dementia um, because they are looked at less than, and it often generates this angst and crisis of faith, anger. And as people lose their cognitive abilities, they may not be able to participate as robustly in their faith activities. They may not be able to get there. They may have trouble with mobility. Um, they may have behavioral problems that make their loved ones nervous, all of those kinds of things. I love this quote. This is from Dr. Ira Bayok, who is really the father of dementia, end of life care, um, hospice care in the United States of America. He said at a conference a number of years ago that Alzheimer's disease glues up the elegant neurological network of the human brain. But if we focus on this tragedy, we miss the gifts because even here, the experience of life holds value. I think if you take nothing else away from today, imprint on this, because it will really help you as you are interacting with others who tend to be dismissive and treat people with dementia as less than. We also have to be careful because many of us who would be interested in helping people with their spiritual care and spiritual expression, maybe that is a come from because it's important to us. And to be fully transparent, I'm gonna share with you, my whole name is Patricia Mary Kathleen Rose. If you'd like to guess at my religious tradition, I invite you to do so. I look like the map of Ireland and there's an awful lot of Jamesons and chapel veils and rosary parties in my history. So I'm Catholic and um, I am still one of those people that attends church and is active and is really engaged in ministries at my parish. I get a little bit excited about things, but it's really important that when we're dealing with people who not only have dementia, but for whom we're providing a, a, a wraparound kind of service assistance, we are not there to convert them to anything. We are not there to save them. We are simply there to be facilitators. And in truth, both of these quotes are very, very applicable because religion, if in heavenly truths attired, really needs only to be seen to be admired. And then one of my favorites is speak only when it improves the silence. 
So be careful how you position this. Make it optional. Make sure people know that um, you're not going to try and change what they believe or how they believe or how they express. You just want to make sure that it's available to them. So examine your mo your motives. Um, I love this. We are not to convert, cajole, correct, save, absolve, atone, evangelize, proselytize, enlighten, preach, exhort, homilize, orate, prophecy, or admonish. You'll never get to heaven if you break the heart of a person with dementia by um, making them feel at all um, distanced from their faith tradition. Think about it. If any of our great religious leaders, Christ, Buddha, Confucius, Abraham, Muhammad, if any of them were visiting this person, what would they be saying to them? Think about that for a little bit and then try and model your behavior accordingly. We have a mission statement in our outreach because we have a very, very robust, comprehensive interfaith outreach at Alzheimer's Orange County. We are a not-for-profit, locally governed, locally administrated, community-based organization. We are not part of any national group. We are solely independent. And this program has been in existence for about 25 years here in Orange County. And it's been written up a few times, and I'm going to get you the link to the write-up by the, um, the uh, Administration on Community Living and the Administration on Aging, um, published a paper about these kinds of programs. And really, we're about the only one in the country that does it like this. But we really want to provide awareness and education and support to faith-based communities, to people of faith, in addition to all of the other people that we serve. We have goals and objectives. We want to get liaisons from houses of, of worship connected to us. We want to work with clergy. We want to provide them with some coaching and information. Um, we have an annual clergy recognition event, so we get people engaged and together. And um, we just really want to keep up attendance at these specially adapted worship services. We offer them once a month in a different house of worship every month. You name the denomination or the type of um, religious expression, and we've had a service there. Um, we've had them at Shinto temples, certainly at uh, with our Jewish brethren, every denomination of the Protestant church, Catholic churches. Um, we've done some LDS. Um, services. So we just really want to be as broad-based and comprehensive as possible. And here at the bottom of this slide, there's an article from 217 by RTI and the Administration on Aging and Administration on Community Living. And it looks like this, Faith-Related Programs in Dementia Care. And this is what some of our material looks like when it goes out into the community. So um, we tell our churches, we tell our houses of worship what we're doing and, and what the plan is and what our objectives are. Okay. Lots of people ask, well, gosh, she doesn't know what day it is. She doesn't recognize her children. What good will it do to get her um, to a prayer service or into church? This surfaces again and again and again especially if we consider that we're not trying to convert anybody. We're not preaching. We are simply offering an opportunity. So the key is we have to do things that are gonna provide some satisfaction to the people we're seeking to serve, the people with dementia. And once you watch people engaging in this kind of activity, you see them reach back into their past. You see them kind of almost palpably capture a feeling of connection to their higher power or their faith tradition. And we want to respect that. We want to foster their dignity. We want them to know that we see the divine in them regardless of their disability. And we know from the literature that spiritual activity for any person, but particularly for people with dementia, can be codified 
and can show that it helps to bring down anxiety levels. Sometimes it can help with reducing behavioral disturbances and agitation. And just like it improves the quality of life for people with normal cognition, it helps people with dementia order things in their lives. We all have a need for meaning and purpose. And the benefits of, of spirituality toward that end are really very, very well established. And I think, you know, we have to keep in mind also that we didn't invent all this. This is the kind of thing that for a couple thousand years, people have known that um, as human beings, we seek to invoke some kind of higher power. Spiritual support of people is an important component of what we all refer to as person-centered dementia care. So how do you know what's gonna benefit somebody in a spiritual sense? Well, one of the things we tell folks when an individual with dementia is moving into a memory care community, I always tell the staff there, they should know a hundred things about this person. Not only who they are and how many children they have and where they lived before they've moved into your community, but who were they? What kind of job did they have? When did they retire? How many children did they have? Did they lose a child? Were they married? How many times? Uh, what was their family life like growing up? Where did they grow up? And what kind of spiritual expression were they accustomed to? Because as people lose their cognition, you all know, if you're part of Dementia Friends, you know that the deeply held long-term memories are like those books on the bottom shelf, the heavy tomes. You don't lose those. And our overlearned memory really enables us to kind of subconsciously reach back into these overlearned activities and it will produce an emotional memory that gives us a good feeling. I think it's really important that in vivo, we have seen some really solid experiences. And I like to tell stories. So at one particular religious um, service, everybody was in the church, beautiful, beautiful, very traditional church with the stained glass windows and the organ and the smell of the wood in the pews. So it was very, very traditional. And there was one gentleman who just was restless and didn't want to sit still. And he kept looking around and he just wasn't settled at all. And as you know, in the blink of an eye, a person with dementia can get up and be on their way. And we all have to be very vigilant to that. Well, he got up and he was heading for the exit. So I just walked with him and caught up with him. And um, I kind of took his elbow. I didn't want to grab him. You know, I wanted to be very gentle, but I just kind of touched his elbow. And I said, so, so where are we off to? And by then he was out of the church and into the courtyard. And it's a beautiful day. And there's rose bushes and some statues, very traditional um, courtyard in front of the church. And um, I said, you know, my name is Patty. And, um, and I'd like to help you. And he looked at me and he said, are you the Lord God? Well, you can see I'm a plump grandmother. I'm certainly not anybody's notion of who the Lord God might be. But I thought, isn't that interesting? He's been in the church. He's been hearing some of the music and some of the discussion. And so he's searching for something. So I said to him, you know, I'm not the Lord God, but I think I know where we can find him. How about if you come with me? And he just absolutely acquiesced to come right back in and sit down. So we have to validate what they're thinking and feeling and really speak to that. At another um, assisted living memory care community, I went in to visit about a day and a half after we had had a service and they had sent probably 15 or 20 of their residents to the service. And after our services, and I'll talk about this a little bit in a minute, um, we usually have a little social fellowship. 
oftentimes there's a little luncheon and refreshments and sometimes live music and dancing. So they, it really it gets to be a fun time. <coughs> Pardon me. And sometimes they'll have party favors. So at this particular service, they had um, um, some um, some coffee mugs with some goodies inside, and every one of the uh, guests got to take one home. So at this particular memory care, um, this actually was at a Silverado. If you know Silverado, they're they're very um, active in California area, and they have several in other states across the country. And at their community, they have a policy that residents can just roam around and sometimes they can come into the executive offices, but there's no bad place for their residents. Everybody can treat it like their home. So this gentleman walked in as we were having a meeting and, um, and I recognized him from the religious service, but I didn't know his name. So I introduced myself. I said, you know, I'm Patty, tell me your name. And he did. And I said, I think I've met you. And he said, oh, really? I said, were you with us yesterday at church? And this is what he said. They gave me a mug and made me feel like myself. Good. I'll never forget it. We are so much more than just what we know who we know, what we can say, what we can convey. In so many ways, we are not human beings having spiritual experiences. We are spiritual beings that are having a human experience. And dementia does not diminish that. And there are so many um, wonderful experts and authors and clergy that have written about this, but one in particular, Kathleen Fisher, who has tremendous experience with dementia, she talks about the fact that spirituality is kind of the deepest dimension in many lives, and it's the ultimate ground for questions, hopes, fears, and loving. It's not a piece of the pie. It's the pie plate. Spirit undergirds everything. And it really manages how a person handles trauma and whether or not he or she sees good as uh, life as good or bad. This is all part of our spiritual expression. So I think it's important that, um, that we look at it differently than we might if we're not necessarily really practicing our own spiritual thought at the time. The supportive presence that we can provide to people with dementia, it recognizes the divine in them. It shows how worthy they are of our attention and our care. And we're facilitating some kind of expression that would be in sync, in alignment with that person's faith tradition and their needs in the moment. But it's not about us. We don't give testimony. We don't convert. We're not there to save anybody. It's about being graceful and gracious. And whatever they need their experience of grace to be in the moment you have with them. Spirituality is just such a dynamic dimension of human life. And, um, and it really does manage how we see the world. So we want to be mindful of that, and we want to help people see it in a very positive way. I love this slide. This is from Time Magazine a long, long time ago. Um, but your brain is busy, particularly when you're having some kind of spiritual experience. And I'm going to talk about some of the parts of the brain and their jobs. But I think it's just really important Look at this one, the temporal lobe, hippocampus, uh, amygdala. These structures are where our emotional memory is housed. And for the most part, most religious or spiritual experiences will have a strong emotional memory component. It creates awe. It creates this joy that we can't necessarily define. 
your brain is working overtime when you're wanting to engage in spiritual activities. It does help calm your brain. It does help create more healthful brain chemistry. If you have dementia, you might be craving that calmness, that transcendence that we get when we're in prayer, when we're in meditation, or when we are feeling a really wonderful spiritual connection. So keep that in mind. That doesn't diminish just because a person has a dementia. We have some very primary spiritual needs. We need to be seen as a person of worth and value. And just because we have developed the dependence of Alzheimer's or a related dementia, it doesn't downgrade our humanity. It should not ever threaten our personhood and it should never strip us of our dignity. We should still be that valued person no matter what. I wanted to just have us think about religious icons and, um, and really keep in mind that anything we do with respect to spiritual expression for people with dementia has to be very culturally informed, very culturally humble, because no matter what our personal religious expression might be, it's no better than someone else's in this case. And I've had people argue with me saying, well, wait a minute, I believe mine is the one true faith and you have to do this in order to be saved. And shouldn't we be talking to people in those terms? The answer is absolutely not. Not when they have dementia. The time for changing their mind about any of these important things is past. The goal now is to make them feel accepted, worthy, valued, worthy of the best care possible, and worthy regardless of their cognitive ability. So we have to be so humble and do what I call inclusive ecumenism. Whatever they believe, we have to respect and support it and offer them the opportunity to facilitate that kind of expression. So I'm just gonna run through these really, really quickly um, because many of you are experts in dementia care, many of you are experts in neuroscience, but just like we looked at how the brain is impacted when we are in prayer or meditation or listening to sacred music, um, every part of our brain has a little bit different function. And when we are facilitating these kinds of activities for people, we have to just keep in mind that there are areas of their brain that might be very, very much um, negatively impacted by their dementia, but there's always some cells that are able to get through. So of course, frontal lobe is, is um, higher thinking and many people support that frontal lobe activity is also critically important in spiritual expression because it is what gives us our personality, our judgment, our social propriety, our social inhibition, and impulse control, and all of those kinds of things. Our parietal lobes are spatial relationships, where we sit so we don't sit too close to somebody in church, or you know, we don't engage in behaviors that are better for the bar on Friday night if we're in church on Sunday morning. Um, it gives us that opportunity to, um, to really compartmentalize how our behaviors should be. If our parietal lobe is impacted by a dementia, then we may not behave that way, the way we're supposed to in church. So part of the beauty of our religious services that are adapted for people with dementia is it doesn't matter. If they have behaviors that come out during the service, everybody understands it and it's really not a big deal. We have had every kind of comment you can imagine about the presider, what the minister is saying, how the minister looks, how the church soprano sounds, if the organist made, um, you know, hit a wrong key. We've had people um, give editorial comments, as you can well imagine. I've heard, boy, is she ugly <laughs> when they're talking about the soloist. Um, everybody just gets it and moves right along. Um, comprehension, sound, 
speech, finding the right word, that's in the temporal lobe. That's also where the amygdala is for uh, emotional memory. So think about how that part of the brain is damaged when somebody has a dementia and, and just, you know, kind of draw the conclusions of how they might not always understand what we're doing, but the sound and the emotional memory connected to the sound and the smells and the light filtering inside a traditional spiritual environment like a church, it does help to conjure up very, very long-term memories. And sight, so some people may not be seeing things correctly. Just be aware of that um, and take all precautions necessary for mobility issues that could be related to sight and so forth. Um, and, and we can't just say, okay, look at the screen and you can sing along. Maybe they don't know where the screen is. Maybe they don't know what a screen is. Maybe they can't see what's up there on the screen and they're not accustomed to looking up at a song screen that many modern churches have. So maybe we do have to have little song sheets for them. Um, or maybe we just choose hymns and prayers that everybody is gonna know because it is such an overlearned memory. We talked about this, we talked about the amygdala. So how do we create this environment? Familiarity. Use religious artifacts, symbols, clothing, booklets, candles, anything that is reminiscent of very traditional kinds of services that this person would have experienced long ago in their past. And when you play hymns, make sure they're not the, the rock and roll, you know, uh, lots of drums and uh, guitar solo um, hymns that we hear today in a lot of modern congregations. Go back to How Great Thou Art, Abide With Me, um, a traditional uh, uh, music uh, to accompany the Lord's Prayer. Even Christmas carols. We've done a lot of Christmas carols in July when people were a little bit agitated or restless because um, they all like to sing along. So just remember to go back to things that are very, very familiar. And if the church uses incense, then have them use incense that day, because those smells can be very primal and really bring us back to the experience that we had when we first um, smelled those aromas. Um, Inspirational music is also relative. Um, one of the things I do in addition to my day job is for years, like 50 years, I have been a cantor and, um, and vocalist at my church. And so I've sung lots of weddings and lots of funerals. And there was a situation where um, a woman had died and she had been a marvelously robust Elvis fan. And her husband was still living and he had dementia. And one of their favorite songs was the Elvis love song, Love Me Tender. So the family asked if I would sing it at graveside when she, her body was being committed into the ground. Well, I kind of had to take a little pause. I had to think about it a little bit. But if you deconstruct the song, it can very easily be offered and interpreted as a hymn of praise. Love me tender, love me long, all my dreams fulfill. Um, oh, my darling, I love you and I always will. Isn't that what God says to most of us? I love you and I always will. So we made it into a hymn of praise but it made her husband really feel like she was there with him. It was a very tender, gentle, beautiful moment. And so we have to think outside the box sometimes. You might see a flash of the divine. You might witness people who are very, very heavily impacted by their dementia who just really are not very responsive or engaged in what's going on in life. 
And sometimes, because this disease is nonlinear, you might have a flash where you know you got through to somebody. Maybe it's the look in their eyes. Maybe there's a twinkle. Maybe there's a smile. Maybe there's a sigh of contentment. These moments happen often. And so you really want to pay attention and lean into it. Um, I tell the story about the last dance. There was a woman who had been a dancer, a ballroom dancer in her life, and was felled by dementia, was now bed bound and couldn't walk. But her caregiver would often come in and play music from church, from ballroom dancing. And whenever she would hear the music, she might not respond at all verbally. She might not even open her eyes, but she would lift up her arms in position as if she were dancing. And he did that for her as she was declining and it stayed with him because he had the last dance with her. He played music, he came in, she held up her arms, he took her hands and did a little sway and they danced a little bit without her really even getting up and out of bed, but just to make her feel like she was dancing. And she laid back down and within about 10 minutes she died. So we could be the ones having the last dance with somebody. And what a privilege would that be? I mean, it's just, it's really almost magical. We have to remember that the way people with dementia describe themselves might be different from what we think they're thinking. There's an author um, who is now deceased. Her name was Christine Bryden. She was diagnosed with early stage, um, uh, early onset Alzheimer's disease at the age of 43. And one of her comments included, I believe I am much more than my brain structure and function. My creation in the divine image is as a soul capable of love, sacrifice, hope, not as a perfect human being in mind or body. I want you to relate to me in that way, seeing me as God sees me. I will trust in God and he will hold me safe in his memory. Very profound. So among the things we have to remember is that we respect people's traditions and we respect their idiosyncrasies. So as we're dealing with people with dementia, we have to understand what is gonna make them comfortable or uncomfortable. Um, I have done work at my local hospital as um, a, a Eucharistic minister. So I bring Holy Communion to people and do a little pastoral visit with them. And I brought communion to a gentleman. He was about 80. He had significant Alzheimer's disease. And he was of Hispanic heritage, kind of old school um, you know, maybe had come here as a middle-aged man and finished raising his family. English was decidedly his second or third language. And here I come with Holy Communion. Well, if you're Catholic, you recognize that it's only been in the last few years, maybe the last 25 years, that it was common to have women giving out Holy Communion. Prior to that, it was the province of the priest and maybe a deacon, um, but it was a male kind of dominated activity. But things are kind of evolving a little bit. But this gentleman may be in his memory of religious expression and receiving Holy Communion. He might not remember that he'd ever received it from a female. So what do you think his reaction was as I come in with the Holy Eucharist and start to say the prayers. He didn't like it a bit. He was really agitated and he's talking to his family in Spanish and I understand a little Spanish. I knew enough to be able to recognize from his body language and tone of voice and a little bit that I understood that he was saying that he didn't think I was Catholic. He didn't want this. So,
so I had to adjust. We are the ones that must adapt because the people that we serve with dementia cannot adapt. So I went over to the nurse's station and I looked around for a man and I looked at him and I said, by any chance, are you a Christian? And he said, well, yes, I am. I said, would you come with me? Because in my tradition, the person who can give Holy Communion to someone else should believe in what they are doing. And so I wanted to um, preserve the sacredness of the activity. So I let this gentleman know, he's a young man, um, you know, what was going on and what I needed him to do. And he said, oh, I'd be honored. And I said, here is the, the prayer card because there's a little service and prayers that we say prior to giving someone Holy Communion. Maybe we read a, a little few lines of scripture, but there's a process to it and a little bit of a sacred ritual. So he did that. I stood behind him in the background. We gave this gentleman his Holy Communion and he just beamed. He was so happy. But we have to be the ones to adapt and make whatever changes and adjustments because the, per the person that we're serving not only isn't going to understand if we try to explain, but even if we explain and it sounds logical, they still might not like it. So we want short, simple, familiar prayers. In this particular church, they had one of the screens that, um, that um, had the prayers and responses and the words to the songs up there. Um, some of our participants could see it, some couldn't. So I do think it's a good idea to have a printed worship aid for the people that can still read. I think that that's an important part of the process. The services that we put on are adapted. They're short, never more than 30 minutes. We use very familiar versions of scripture. Sometimes the new translations don't resonate with people that are a little bit older and who have dementia. So we go back to the King James Version or the Douay Version of the Catholic Bible so that it's gonna sound very familiar. We use old fashioned hymns and most of the time we do the first verse only. Exception would be some of the Christmas carols because the third verse of it came upon a midnight clear. I've never heard people sing so strongly in my life as the ones that were at a dementia service. So gauge that. But generally, the first verse is the best because people can remember it. Make sure you're not on a tight schedule. Um, there shouldn't be a wedding coming in right after you because even if you plan for the service to be 45 minutes, a lot of that time is gonna be getting people in and seated and then getting people up and out. So the meat of the service is gonna be 20, 25 minutes, but you don't want somebody waiting to come in and have their next thing at the church. So no tight scheduling, very relaxed, very adaptable. You really wanna prep and support the minister. There's a number of books that have been written on how to structure a religious service that would be conducive to participation with people with dementia. And um, I can send you a, a reading list, but um, the, uh, the national group, um, Us Against Alzheimer's, has a corridor of clergy against Alzheimer's. And they've done some wonderful work too, and we, we uh, use their work to help support this. Um, we make sure that the minister knows this is not a fire and brimstone service. This is not an altar call service. This is not about salvation. This is about making people feel some grace, feel supported, feel loved, and have it be just a wonderful, happy, loving message. And um, that we don't have a job to do. This is not a job for saving souls. This is just to allow people to express and tap into their spiritual side. And this is what it looks like. All those beautiful little gray heads. And we go everywhere. And we do encourage the clergy to wear their vestments because it does create a sense of familiarity. 
and people come to us, usually about seven or eight memory care communities bring residents in their shuttles. So we have staff and trained volunteers there to help people get off the bus, come into the church, people that will kind of stay there and sit with them while we're getting other people in. Most of the memory care communities send one or two staff members as well. And we identify people with a little sticker on their lapel so we know which community they belong to. And, um, and we just make it very friendly and nice and easygoing. And I do like to pick churches that have a very traditional feel because I do think it makes it easier for people to hearken back to times that, that would be very meaningful to them. We know that these spiritual interventions make a huge difference in how people interact then. And, and we know that the way they feel if they've gotten a really great experience at a religious service or some sort of um, activity where they're having spiritual expression, that happy brain chemistry stays with them for a while, makes them feel good, gives them that warm, fuzzy feeling inside. So we want to foster that. We know that spiritual interventions help us find meaning. And one of the big problems of people with advanced dementia is they don't feel a purpose or a lot of meaning in their life. They have forgotten some of the things that brought them purpose and meaning. So we want them to feel as though they're contributing. We want them to be taking experiences of love and truth and beauty, noble experiences from the world. And we can present this to them in a religious service. And we want to be thinking about the ways that we as normally cognitive individuals can make sense out of suffering without it going into bitterness or despair, because then we can help others who maybe can't put their word or their thoughts into words, or maybe they don't even understand their suffering. Um, we wanna be able to allay that suffering, calm their fears, make them feel loved, wanted, worthy of the best possible care, and we want to give them meaning. And this can happen through some of these experiences. You want to get to know local resources. Um, we have gotten to know the pastors in our parishes and the, and the ministers of many, many denominations. I've gotten to be very close friends with some of our active rabbis. We're working very hard to, to really cement great relationships with our Islamic communities. So, it's a great way to reach out and perform your own ecumenical interface and um, just get to know people, get to know other organizations that might be interested in what you're doing and might want to participate and help you and partner with you. So um, there's never been a time that I've had a church congregation or a memory care assisted living community say, no, nah, no, nah, we're not interested. Sometimes they can't get there. Sometimes they don't have a driver for the shuttle. Sometimes it's the wrong day of the week. Okay, maybe they can't come every single time, but we haven't ever had anybody say, nah, we don't like this. Everybody kind of looks at it and goes, wow, this is really exciting. How did you happen to do this? Well, I'll tell you how we happened to do it. We started this about 25 years ago it was recognized by the CEO of our organization at the time is that there were barriers to people having expression of spirituality and that people, uh, family members were concerned about taking someone to a church service, a regular church service, because they might act out, they might have to go to the bathroom five times, they might get restless, um, they might say something out loud that was inappropriate, so they were concerned about it. So we set about creating a safe environment where people could come and it wouldn't matter what kinds of behavioral disturbances they had. It wouldn't matter if somebody um, had an accident, we can get that taken care of. And we tried to structure it in such a way that would be welcoming and affirming and, um, and really uplifting for everyone. Um, 
there are many, many barriers to spiritual care. And I, I quote and, and reference a lot of really well-known authors in spirituality and care of the aging. One of my favorites is Thomas Kitwood. And one of the things that he identifies as a barrier to spiritual care is the fact that as we move beyond our own anxieties and defenses, it's kind of hard sometimes um, if we have put up those walls as a normally cognitive individual, we're kind of closed off sometimes. But if we can get beyond some of that, we can be right alongside the people with dementia that we serve. And true meeting can occur on, on kind of a soulful level. And these life-giving kinds of relationships can then flourish because we are facilitating and allowing people to feel that spiritual mojo, if you will. And, you know, sometimes they, they feel it tremendously and sometimes not. But if they just get a little sprinkling of it, a little bit of the magic, that's an important breakthrough. And we can celebrate that. And, um, and you have to be thinking too, what am I comfortable with expressing spiritually? If you were to go to a service that a group you had participated with had adapted and invited a congregation or a church full of people with dementia, how would you feel about expressing yourself in that environment? You almost have to strip away any of your walls and just be ready because it really becomes a very elemental soul level kind of experience. And, um, and you really can see just how moving it is for the people with dementia that we serve. And you know the way they express themselves may not be 100% comfortable for us, um, we had a service not long ago at an AME church, um, an African-American Episcopal church, um, and it was wonderful. We actually brought in a choir of people with dementia who had rehearsed for many weeks to be ready, and the church had singers. And, and the way the congregants in that particular church respond is very vocal and spirited and you know call and response well it it really became a very very warm welcoming safe environment because you know what if somebody who's cognitively normal is responding to what the preacher said or is singing at the top of their voice with all their heart the people with dementia felt free and had permission to do so as well. And it created a beautiful opportunity for people to just let go and really experience the grace of the moment. So that was really wonderful. We're dealing with people who have lost some of their spiritual coping skills, who have maybe even some shame um, because they don't understand that the dementia is not their fault. Um, they might feel like they've been abandoned by God. They might be experiencing some feelings of grief and loss. And they might have a fear of failure because sometimes if people have some self-awareness about their cognitive problems, they might be reluctant to do something because they're just not sure. So part of our job is to just open those doors, make them feel safe, make them feel comfortable and be true facilitators of the spiritual expression. And so we have so much encouragement from the wisdom of the ages. You know, I did not invent a lot of this. Most of the time I am quoting from, from people that um, are much smarter and, and much deep, more deeply spiritual than I. But I have a really, really wonderful quote from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And she says, the most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, 
gentleness, and deep loving concern. We have to dive into that in order to provide this kind of foundational support and create this safety and this um, emotional pillow for people with dementia to be able to open up and feel their own spirituality. So I'm getting to the end of my talk. It looks like I'm right on time. Um, these are some of my references. Um, I, I actually add things all the time because um, there's so much that's being written and, and so many things that can help us as we are um, looking to find ways to minister to the people that we serve.